We've seen already several examples of computing antiderivatives, aka indefinite integrals, using this technique of u substitution. Uh, what I want to do now is change directions a little bit and look at uh, definite integrals and see how u substitution can help us in that regard. So if we want to integrate from 0 to 5 x times the square root of x, or 25 minus x squared dx, uh, how could one go about doing this? <clears throat> well, for, for any problem with um, involving indefinite integral, or sorry, involving definite integrals, you can always start off by just approaching as a indefinite problem, right? So we want to integrate x times the square root of 25 minus x squared dx. And this is basically because of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can compute the area of the curve using antiderivatives. And so when you look at this integral right here, uh, we are inclined to try to use some type of u substitution, where we take u to be 25 minus x squared, in which case then du equals negative 2x dx. Uh, we have the x right here, we have the dx right here. We need a negative 2, so make sure you divide by negative 2 right there. And so then our integral would look something like negative 1 half, the integral of u to the 1 half power, because the square root of 25 minus x squared uh, would give us the, 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 square, the u to the 1 half power. And then the negative 2x dx becomes a du. So it becomes something like that there. And then continuing on, uh, by the power rule for antiderivatives, the antiderivative u to the 1 half becomes u to the 3 halves. You raise the power by 1, divide everything by 3 halves, plus a constant. Uh, then we see that since you're dividing by 2 thirds, uh, you're going to get the negative 1 half. But then you're going to, if you divide by, sorry, if you divide by 3 halves, you should times by 2 thirds. Like that, the, one, the 2 should cancel. Uh, u to the 3 halves plus a constant. And so then in the end, you get this antiderivative of negative one-half, I guess actually negative one-sixth. Uh, the, nope, the two's canceled out. Negative one-third is what we get there. Uh, and then u was 25 minus x squared, three-halves plus a constant. So this gives us our antiderivative. Uh, sorry, that gives us our antiderivative there. Uh, and so then to evaluate the indefinite integral, right? We're going from 0 to 5 x times the square root of 25 minus x squared dx. Well, what we need to do is find an antiderivative, which whoop, we have one now. We're going to get negative 1 third 25 minus x squared 3 halves. We evaluate it from 0 to 5. You don't have to worry about the constant with you do these definite integrals here. And so when we plug in the five and the zero, we end up with a negative one third. We get 25 minus, well, five squared is 25, uh, raised to the three halves. And then we subtract from that 25 minus zero squared, which is zero, three halves there. And so notice 25 take away 25 is zero. So you get zero to the three halves, of course, is just zero. And then you're gonna get 25 to the three halves. Uh, when dealing with these rational exponents, I usually like to take the radicals first, the one-half power. So the one-half power of, so when you look at this, the one-half power of 25 will give you a 5, so you get 5 cubed, uh, which is going to be 125. And so we end up with negative one-third times negative 125, which would then simplify to become 125 over 3, uh, which is the area under this curve right here. And so this is a perfectly acceptable way of computing uh, these antiderivatives, or that, that is calculating these indefinite integrals. Sorry, definite integrals. That's what we're working on right now. What I want to do is actually approach this problem from a second perspective. So if we were to do the remake of this problem right here, we're going from 0 to 5x times the square root of 25 minus x squared dx, like so. Uh, what if we don't bother with the indefinite integral first, could we sort of start with the uh, with the definite integral? Because after all, we still get this u substitution we had before. We could do u equals 25 minus x squared, and then du would equal negative 2x dx. And so we're still in a position where we can have a negative 1 half in front and a negative 2 right there. Uh, but the issue that I want to address is what can you do with these right here? Because after all, when you look at the limits 
here, the bounds of the integral, these are x coordinates when x equals zero and x equals four. These could potentially be adapted as well. And by adapting them, can we change, can we change the bounds to be into the variable x instead? Because if I can use, sort of use the following analogy, as we're looking for areas under the curve, right? We've been mostly focused with this approach where we're trying to find the area under the curve using rectangles. We use rectangles to find the area of the curve. And by taking, you know, sufficiently small rectangles, we can do a pretty good job with that. But why do we have to use rectangles? Why couldn't we not use something that maybe fits the curve a little bit better? And we've seen this example where using trapezoids can actually be a much better approach to finding the area under the curve. That is, what if there's a slant to it? Uh, that is, if we switch up the shape, we don't have to use rectangles at the time. And this U substitution technique, in some regards, the change of the variable is like changing the shape. That the original problem started off with rectangles, but why not switch to trapezoids? Or why not switch to circles or parabolas? Things that might fit better under the curve. And so, because of this relationship, u equals 25 minus x squared, we could think of this as a function relationship. What happens when x equals 5? What happens when x equals 0? Well, when x equals 5, if we plug this into the function, u would equal 25 minus 5 squared. Which, if we simplify that, we end up with 25 minus 25, which equals 0. And then, likewise, what is u when x is 0? So u, minus, u equals 25 minus 0 squared here. Uh, this would be 25 minus 0, which is equal to 25. And so if we approach the integral with this perspective, the original integral, negative 1 half the integral from 0 to 5 of negative 2x times the square root of 25x squared, dx, we could switch the limits of the integral when we switch the variable. So the negative 2x dx, that just becomes a du. And the square root of 25 minus x squared, that becomes u to the 1 half power. But then if we change the limits, when u equals, uh, sorry, when x equals 0, u will equal 25. And when x equals 5, u will equal 0. And so we can change the bounds. And so now we have a simpler, in, uh, a simpler definite integral here. Because after all, if we're looking for the integral, the definite integral, this is the area of the curve. The area of the curve is not a function. It is a number. We're trying to find a number. And the fundamental theorem of calculus says we can find an antiderivative to help us find that number. But our goal is not to find the definite integral. The goal is to find this number. Now here, if you don't like that the 25 is on the bottom, you can switch the order. Uh, this is something we do all the time. But if you switch the order of the limits, you have to negate it. And that's actually great because we have this negative sign that's already in front. So it's like, oh, that's a win-win situation for me. So you're going to get 1 half the integral from 0 to 25 of u to the 1 half du. And then the antiderivative, like we kind of, similar to what we saw before, the antiderivative, you'll take 1 to the power, so that gives you 3 halves. You'll times it by 2 thirds. Uh, there was already a 2 right there. There was a 1 half in front, sorry. So... When you take one half times two thirds, you end up with one third. And then you evaluate this from zero to 25. Plugging in zero will give you zero. Plugging in 25 will give you uh, 125. So you get one third, 25 to the two thirds, sorry, three halves, minus zero to the three halves. And you end up in, again with the exact same number, 125 over three. So the technique doesn't change I should say the answer doesn't change based upon the technique, uh, but we have these two different approaches. We can find the antiderivative in terms of x and then plug those in, in terms of x, or we can turn away from x, face towards this new variable u, and then solve the problem with u. <clears throat> Either approach is quite successful. And in fact, I'm a big fan of this second approach. As, as a person who somehow missed this the first time I saw it, probably I, I probably just didn't understand what my professor was talking about the first time I saw this type of problem in calculus. And so these numbers sort of mysteriously changed from 0 to 5 to 25 and 0. And so for a good long time, I would do the first approach. 
And then, like, in Calculus 3, I finally figured out what my professor was doing. Honestly, I was the goober who should have just asked a question, but I was too embarrassed to do so. Don't don't be like me, right? You should, if you have a question, you should ask, ask, right? Um, either if, if you're in a class, ask your question. Um, if you're watching this video, post the comment, ask your question so you don't get trapped in some misinformation for a long time. But once I finally figured out how this, this change of limits worked out, I love this new one over here. It's my favorite. Uh, it's so nice to switch these variables. And the more and more we do with these things, the more and more you're gonna see that switching these variables is a good friend of ours. Uh, let's like a, look at another one of these. Let's integrate from one to E, the natural log of X over X DX. And you might wonder why would E be my upper bound? But for this function, that's actually quite generous. Now in this situation, we're looking for a function whose derivative is present in the integrand. And we might be interested in selecting the bottom, but if you just set u equal to x, that really doesn't do you a lick of good here. Um, instead, let's actually choose u to be the natural log of x. If we take u to be the natural log of x, then its derivative is equal to one over x dx. And you'll see that's exactly what we have in this integral. Uh, we can take the integral here, the natural log becomes a u, and then the dx over x becomes a du. So we're almost there, except there are these bounds here. How do the limits change? Well, if x equals e or x equals one, well, when x equals e, you're gonna get u equals the natural log of e, aka one. And if x equals one, then u will equal the natural log of one, aka zero. And so for our function here, our lower bound will be u equals zero and the upper bound will be u equals one. So in the original coordinate system, you had one in E. E was sort of ob obnoxious, but when you switch from the X coordinates to the natural log of X coordinates, AKA U coordinates, this X works out really nicely. Antiderivative of U becomes U squared over two, plug in zero and one, you end up with one squared over two minus zero squared over two, and you end up with the final answer of one half, which is pretty slick. Changing the limits is something you want to do uh, as you're working with antiderivatives that might involve a u substitution. If you're doing a definite integral and you have to use u substitution to find the antiderivative, I say just switch to u coordinates and never ever turn back to x. Don't be like Lot's wife and look back and turn into salt. You don't wanna do that. Um, instead, look forward, switch to your new variables and just go from there. Bye everyone, we'll talk some more about this next time. See ya.